Hello and welcome to the last lecture. My name is Dr. Owen Redwood and this is part of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 Open Courseware hosted by HackAllTheThings.com. In this last lecture we're going to present a course review going over all the topics that we covered in this course. We're then going to talk about some recent trends in offensive cybersecurity and then finally the last topic of the course strategies and guidelines for running an effective security operation center. And then the last part of this lecture will be a review for the final exam, which is a take-home final exam. In the very first lecture, we discussed ethics and an introduction to vulnerability research and the disclosure debate and ethics of pen testing and the pen testing life cycle. Very simple stuff. Then we dived into C and C++ security, discussing vulnerabilities and all the different types, uh, covering buffer overflows for stack and heap, integer uh, bugs, especially integer signedness bugs, heap bugs, including use after free and double free pointer bugs, scoping bugs, type confusion, polymorphism bugs, race conditions, and etc. Then we covered some code auditing topics with a lot of exercises. We discussed the CVE and CWE terms and some strategies for effectively hunting for bugs and source code. Uh, mainly they boil down to hunting the code written by the senior developers because they're usually in charge of gluing together uh, other people's code and they deal with some of the most complex problems because they're trusted the most and therefore there's a greater occurrence just naturally so of uh, risk uh, of vulnerabilities and risks of causing them in uh, the senior developers edits and also hunt down any code that uh, is written by a developer who has a history of creating vulnerable code then we covered linux and windows internals we covered permissions and security measures that the operating systems provide, how file systems work, and what actually happens when you delete a file. We discussed many of the logs on these systems, and we discussed rootkits and rootkit defenses for each of these systems. We had a reverse engineering workshop for x86 32-bit. We did discuss some 64-bit, but in general you should be familiar with stack mechanics. You should be able to identify a function prologue and epilogue and you should have had some hands-on with IDA both in the exercises as well as the homeworks. We then moved on to cover fuzzing and bug hunting. So we covered mutational, generational, and hybrid based fuzzing. We discussed introspection and code coverage and uh, the uh, test case explosion problems and challenges uh, and the complexity issues. Uh, we discussed fuzzing campaigns and also revisited vulnerability disclosure and essentially uh, the way to go about it and what you need to know in order to prove that it is a vulnerability in order to effectively disclose it or communicate it. And that was part of homework five, the VLC or uh, application fuzzing exercise. Then we moved on to many lectures on modern binary exploitation and exploit development. So we discussed exploitation of all the C and C++ vulnerabilities, stack exploitation, heap-based exploitation. We discussed all the exploit mitigations and exploit mitigation bypass techniques. So ROP, info leaks, global offset table overwrites, fixed VMAs, and other special gadgets. We discussed exploit mitigation suites such as EMET, GRSEC, PAX, current heap, and etc. And we had a lot of discussion of basic and advanced payload or otherwise shellcode design talking about or showing proof of concepts for everything including uh, file descriptor reuse, port binding, and connect back shellcode, dynamically linking shellcode, as well as alphanumeric, polymorphic, and encoded shellcode. We had two lectures on network security and it is not sufficient in order to have a complete grasp of all of the offensive cybersecurity issues that 
involve just networking. And so we only covered a limited TCP IP coverage, limited transport layer uh, discussion. And uh, in this, these lectures, we showed off port binding and connect back shellcode and discussed them in reference to firewalls. Also discussed DNS security and intrusion detection systems and prevention systems. We covered a lot of topics in web application exploitation and broke it down into client-side attacks covering how browsers are architected, the internals of a browser engine. We talked about browser same origin policy, SOP, as well as several techniques for bypassing that defensive mechanism. We discussed client-side attacks, uh, most notably cross-site scripting. Server-side attacks, that lecture was very long and we heavily focused on SQL injection. We also discussed file inclusion, cross-site uh, request forgery, and etc., as well as defenses. We also had a lecture on certificates and SSL and TLS and the uh, modern flaws in the public key infrastructure and uh, on the internet. And we finally discussed web application firewalls and their limitations. And uh, many, uh, it, it mostly boils down to web application firewalls if they are not set up right on some form of uh, HTTPS proxy for your uh, gateway. Uh, they, or if they aren't set up with the right certs, they're not going to be able to decrypt any encrypted traffic and attacks could be coming over that. Furthermore, uh, an additional measure is uh, session splicing uh, often defeats web application firewalls because it can't uh, splice back together the entire flow of traffic for the session. We then covered social engineering and physical security. We discussed some intelligence gathering topics. Uh, the magic word of social engineering is because just it alone statistically improves your compliance rate. Um, but it depends on what reason you give. If you give them a reason that's going to raise red flags, it's not going to help you at all. We discussed six widely exploited quirks of the human brain. We discussed social engineering defenses, and then we moved on to locks and lock picking, lock picking mitigations, physical access tools that are commercially available, and physical, physical access attack vectors such as X10, uh, broadband over power lines, BPL, and other th things that large organizations need to be aware of, such as the access points for their building automation control networks. The previous lecture covered digital forensics and incident response. We discussed uh, DFIR teams and team roles, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work they might expect, indicators of compromise and the standards that uh, exist to communicate and structure them. We discussed a DFIR toolkit that is advisable covering many free open source solutions that are used by lots of professionals. And we showed off volatility uh, demo. And uh, today we're going to follow up these topics with, with a discussion on SIEM. Next, we'll discuss some notable trends in the offensive cybersecurity world before we cover SIEM stuff. Attacks on businesses are reportedly increasing. Um, according to a 2013 industry-sponsored report, the average annual cost of cybercrime per sample of 60 large corporations was $11.6 million, with a range of impacts from $1.3 million to $58 million per company for any attack. This amount is up from $8.9 million in the pr previous year and is measured at a 26% increase, just from 2012 to 2013. Additionally, uh, 60 companies reported approximately 122 successful cyber attacks per week, or otherwise two per company per week. That's two attacks getting into large, well-equipped organizations that spend millions on cybersecurity per week. And this figure is up from the prior year in which companies reported only 102 successful attacks per week. These two statistics, and points are from a 2013 report titled Economic and Financial Crime produced by the National Center 
for victims of crime. And it's, for, it's can be found at this URL. Uh, these stats are on page five. Uh, other points worth discussing is that medical identity theft is on the rise and that uh, medical records, stolen ones, are worth more than your stolen credit card. Uh, stolen credit cards can usually be sold anywhere from uh, 10 cents to uh, two and a half dollars uh, on the black market and medical records usually start at ten dollars and they're used to facilitate Medicare fraud which is increasingly profitable um, and thankfully justice departments are really cracking down on that. Additionally, there's been a large surge of ransomware since the last uh, uh, time I taught this course, and 99% of them start with phishing emails, and the rest are delivered through malicious pop-ups and advertisements, say for fake antivirus or pop-ups saying, your system has been infected, download this, blah, blah, blah and we'll clean it up. That's an example of fake AV. But there's also fake Java updates, fake Flash updates, fake Windows updates that will pop up with uh, uh, browsing various internet sites. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a malicious site. Often sites cannot police the advertisements that are delivered through their uh, advertising uh, third parties. And the advertising parties are not doing nearly enough to police the ads that they are serving up. In 2013, uh, it was reported that over 1.5 million uh, digitally signed new items of malware were discovered. And you would assume that digital signatures requiring a binary to have a, a trusted digital signature, a valid one that your OS vendor uh, trusts, that chain is intact, would be sufficient to prevent most malware from uh, affecting your systems. And this has been true, uh, been actually found to be false because as we discussed in the, uh, the certificate lectures that they do not actually do their job often in verifying who is getting what signatures. And we already discussed it uh, earlier that uh, just two separate teams of researchers were able to get root signing certs for various orgs enabling this style of attack. In 2014, uh, there were a series of very serious SSL bugs. Uh, the Apple go to fail bug, the, uh, the Linux um, crypto bug that actually had almost no crypto in the SSL session and finally Heartbleed. Uh, when I was teaching the 2014 one, the team uh, from Codenomicon that discovered the Heartbleed bug was actually scheduled to come out and teach one of the lectures, but that same week they had to cancel because they discovered this bug and were swamped with disclosing it to the proper channels. Such is life. So, um, Heartbleed was so widespread in terms of its impact, it required almost everyone on the internet uh, to change at least one password. The, li the list of all affected official websites is provided at this URL. And to date, it still affects millions of embedded systems worldwide, if not tens of millions. And this is mainly routers that are going to be affected by these. Um, so there's a pretty good comic uh, on how Heartbleed works. It's about four panes. Uh, from XKCD and the feature that Heartbleed exploits is some form of uh, keep alive feature in which the uh, client asks the server, hey, are you still there? If so, reply with this uh, response and the server will respond. But the thing is you tell it how many letters or characters you want it to respond with and so you can easily exploit it, and here's just bird showing that it replies with bird, um, by telling it a much larger amount of letters and it will leak all of the uh, adjacent memory. So this is just a info leak bug. And what, they, what the POC proof of concept exploits for this demonstrate is uh, the ability to leak and 
pull out keys, encryption keys from memory of the server, giving you the ability to decrypt other traffic coming from the server. Uh, there is a proof of concept exploit provided here on this link at GitHub from SensePost. One of the largest cases from Heartbleed was uh, Akame. They are a major content delivery network for most uh, sites on the internet. And they had a custom patch that they rolled on their own for Heartbleed, but it proved to be still vulnerable. And attackers uh, discovered how to exploit the remaining vulnerability from their uh, custom patch. And it was found that they were attacked. Uh, there's a, <clears throat> a report uh, talking about how they admitted they issued faulty open SSL keys from their patch and then had to reissue new keys. And uh, the impact was that they serve uh, content as a third party service for about 30% of the internet. And that exposed uh, the uh, HTTPS delivery of that content. Um, which was pr pretty widespread. Um, but there's more serious issues that involve hacking that have been on the rise, most notably electric grid and critical infrastructure attacks. Uh, the largest one in terms of total number of machines affected would be the Saudi Aramco corporate sabotage in 2015, where 35,000 plus machines were, uh, were wiped. Their hard drives were erased and data was lost and uh, it was it's still holds the crown for the largest hack in history in terms of scale and damage um, in terms of uh, that that's uh, oil and petroleum and in terms of the electric grid the most recent one event would be the Ukrainian power grid attack in December 2015 and this was a uh, power outage caused by cyber uh, attack and the attack vector they got in by was social engineering phishing emails and uh, the dark reading room uh, dot com uh, link here has a good summary of it in general critical critical infrastructure attacks are on a sharp rise both in the US and around the world and it's becoming an increasingly serious issue now to cover the incredibly controversial developments in election hacking and election rigging around the world. Uh, these events go back as far as 2005 and 2006. Uh, to start off, the 2006 Venezuelan election was extremely suspicious. Uh, it was upheld and it kept the incumbent power parties in power, uh, which is usually how it always happens. or how the results always happen and in this New York Times article it describes how allegedly Smartmatic voting machines were used to uh, flip votes and rig the election and keep the incumbent party in power despite uh, third-party polling showing that it should have been a landslide for the opposition party now this is linked to the next story which is a confession from a hacker who offered his services in, in the style of a mercenary to political uh, parties and uh, rulers of countries uh, throughout South America. And his campaign across multiple countries offering rigging elections for money spanned from 2005 to 2012 and he hacked the elections of allegedly multiple countries, including having his hands in orchestrating the Venezuelan uh, rigged election. I highly recommend reading this story. Uh, the allegations of this man's confession are astounding. And while you may discount them as uh, things that could only occur in a third world country, I would then point you to the very recent hacking or rigging of the Austrian election. Austria is in Europe and there's two links provided. Uh, they're English links. Uh, you can find uh, Austrian uh, local news stories uh, for this event and essentially what happened in July is that the Supreme Court or courts of Austria 
ruled that the 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 ballot counts did not match anywhere near the poll counts and they ruled that the election was over should be overturned and is uh, likely fraudulent and they scheduled for a do-over of the election with greater oversight and introspection uh, of the process and greater integrity controls i'd like to take this opportunity to note that it does not re- Require the presence of electronic voting machines in order to rig an election that's been demonstrated throughout history with paper ballots and stuffing ballot boxes. And uh, finally, uh, as for the upcoming U.S. election, which is happening in November 2016, I don't even want to discuss it. Uh, it is going to be a topic that is up is to be determined how that plays out. On a different note, uh, another trend worth covering is the rise of uh, smart device botnets or IoT botnets. And most notably and most recently is the Mirai botnet. The source code was released, and that's at the bottom link below. Um, but a article from Ars Technica on the impact of an activity of the botnet is linked above. So. To, this is partially a recap, but the three main problems of stopping attackers uh, in the realm of international laws is A, the attribution problem, B, the jurisdiction problem. The vast majority of attackers are outside your legal jurisdiction, um, and law enforcement is not equipped, especially local law enforcement, to deal with international threats. And three, the ambiguity problem, where it is very easy to mimic other actors if you have enough resources and to make attacks look like their work. To throw out some facts, in the United Kingdom there were only 45 successful cybercrime prosecutions in 2014 and there were only 61 in 2015. However, its prevalence and occurrence is surpassing traditional crime and that can be found at the, the links provided. In the United States in 2014, there were only 194 computer fraud criminal cases filed, and I presume that is under the uh, CFAA. And in 2015, there were only 153 computer cases filed. And you can find the statistics and discussion of that at the bottom two links. I highly recommend the, bl- the linked Black Hat uh, presentation on how federal prosecutors use the CFAA. Uh, That's a a very good legal discussion. And I am not a lawyer, so don't take any of the things I say as legal advice. You should consult a lawyer. Anyways, now to discuss some strategies and guidelines for effective security operations centers, operations, because you cannot rely on catching the bad guys and getting your money back. Those crime statistics alone should show you that uh, in in almost the general case, you can't rely on catching the people attacking you, especially when you're getting attacked 200 plus times a week and they're putting away less than 200 cases and successful prosecutions per year. And so the way forward is really to recruit people that uh, can achieve superior defense because they have superior offensive knowledge and skill. And this comes back to the ancient Latin saying, uh, civis pacem parabellum, which means if you want peace, seek war, or sorry, prepare for war. Uh, para is prepare, and vis is seek. Um, and so I'd like to note on that point that in my research, almost every single exploit mitigation that we've discussed and that the field has deployed recently was a, a mechanism that was conceived over 20 or more years ago by very paranoid sysadmins and developers and compiler developers in uh, various message boards and email threads. They really understood the fundamentals of exploitation. They haven't changed much over the years. Uh, They came up with the concepts of ASLR, DEP, and CFI, especially in terms of having a shadow stack for control flow data and uh, um, other mechanisms. And uh, I'd like to point out the the XKCD comic at the bottom. Uh, It's 
a play on uh, the Die Hard uh, 1 movie. And uh, I'd like to move on to breaking down, breaking out okay, two categories of things that are often found in security operation centers and classifying them as essential versus useless things. Some essential things that you should consider having for your security operation centers, two or more packet capture tools, because one can go down and that will leave you blind. Your ability to detect attacks is only as good as your ability to collect logs and packets. The next thing is you need to be able to collect all the logs. You should have a logging aggregation service so that you can remotely, uh, you can collect all the logs from all of the endpoints in your org. This just covers host logs, network logs, uh, event logs, and part of this pipeline involves uh, log aggregators as well as log scanners and uh, alerts. You should lock down the egress filtering for your wire, for your firewall, both for your SOC as well as for your org networks. That will stop the vast majority of campaigns in terms of uh, uh, modern trends. You should have introspection at the packet level and at the log level within each subnet and each network bridge and gateway. You should have some remote imaging tools like the ones we discussed in the last lecture to get memory images from devices you may have to do forensics and incident response on. You should use virtualization and snapshotting technologies wherever possible for the members of your organization, especially if their jobs aren't technical. That way, the remediation of the infection of their systems may be as simple as restoring a virtual machine snapshot which should be perhaps taken weekly or daily to minimize uh, data loss. You should have a separate isolated subnetwork for your SOC. And inside the SOC, you should have static networking. There should be absolutely no SIP phones or VoIP phones or VoIP software of any kind in the SOC. Encryption should be everywhere in the SOC. Every connection should be encrypted. And you should have solid physical security for the SOC because that is the brainstem of the security of your organization. It gets feeds from everything in your org network. And if someone gets inside that, they have potentially access to almost everything. Some useless things that I see commonly in security operation centers are monitors up on the screen with animated world maps showing threats bouncing around everywhere. This is absolutely useless unless you are an international org with multiple sites around the world and you have uh, this to, to show alerts popping up so you can correlate them. Or two, if you provide services to a customer base that is international. That way you can correlate possible DDoS activity with taking down entire uh, demographics of your customers uh, say on a, a geospatial uh, uh, level, uh, like if the European pipes are getting DDoS to hell, that would explain why your European customers are having trouble connecting to your services. Another useless thing I'd like to point out is any and all anomalies detection systems that are unattended and unmaintained. These things are not often plug and play and the rate of change both in topology as well as technology for most organizational networks is so high that leaving a anomaly detector unattended for a couple months will make it completely useless, if not more sooner than that. Another useless item, people in the SOC who tend to jump to conclusions often and, can't, and tend to rule out other possibilities or theories. On that note, people who are completely useless and also detrimental are people who panic when you are under attack. Those people probably should not be in your security operations team. Other things to list are unmaintained network maps, unmaintained digital forensics and incident response plans, screens with CNN or some other news on them. Uh, I have never seen mainstream media really cover 
in a timely manner any accurate uh, news about cyber attacks around the world. So if you're relying on them to tell you what's going on in c cybersecurity, you've got it completely backwards. Uh, now let's cover some policies. I've got three slides on this for running an effective SOC. Uh, the first one is that you should have af have all of your active network scanning and pen testing uh, be done outside of your SOC. It should be done from a separate individual subnetwork so that your IDS and IPS uh, uh, tools do not flag your SOC and uh, lock down uh, any of your SOC's ability to uh, aggregate logs and etc. It also, doing these activities from the SOC, just end map scans, will pollute the logs and uh, can affect any anomaly detectors. So all proactive security measures should be done outside of your SOC on a totally different network. Uh, that way you can filter it out. Uh, you can filter it out from your own SOC, but uh, you don't want to deal with that if you're in the middle of dealing with an attack and collecting evidence to prepare for any legal case. You don't want to ha have that as a thing you have to explain in a courtroom. It's just one more thing to complicate an already complicated situation. Another policy worth suggesting is everything in the SOC should have redundancy of different vendors uh, as well as your network backbone. Uh, so you should have uh, two or more UPSs for every system in your SOC, two or more power supply boxes. All, for all of your networking gear, you should have uh, two or more switches, routers, etc. And your gear closet should have backup supplies with everything uh, you need to build another SOC room in case something happens. And here's the reason why. Uh, you should have redundancies for different vendors. So you shouldn't have two of the same vendor. You should have two different vendors, but of things that you are comfortable deploying on your network and uh, can set up. The reason is because when you have uh, zero days released for certain devices of a vendor, your only option may be to replace that device on your network until it gets patched. Otherwise, you are running uh, potentially with that attack vector wide open, uh, depending on your attack surface and your network. Um, and secondly, Things can go down in terms of hardware failures at the worst times. Um, so that's why I suggest having backup UPSs and power supplies. You should definitely have backup uh, UPSs if you're, if you're network connecting your UPSs and controlling them. Um, those are definitely systems that almost never get updated in terms of security patches, but they have had... Uh, you can find uh, UPS exploits on ExploitDB and other uh, proof of concept repos showing uh, uh, exploits for these systems. And it can be really problematic when someone exploits that and then just cuts off power for everything and then you lose your feeds and uh, you may have no idea what's going on. And so being able to physically replace that UPS may be what gets you back up online and running. But I digress. Uh, in the actual construction of the sock room, uh, your flame retardants should be non-toxic gas, and they should be uh, they should not be water-based at all. Because in the event of a physical plus cyber event, say it's an insider threat who pulls the fire alarm on the way out of whatever they've done, you don't want your forensic evidence being washed away. Now, talking about evidence, any collected evidence in the middle of an incident response should have a an evidence acquisition form b lists of checksums for all digital evidence that have been collected over the course of the response c a chain of custody form which is a spreadsheet that lists everyone who has ever touched it from the moment it was collected how it was collected and to the moment it was delivered to law enforcement and for these, every entry should have a time, date, and signature of the person for every single access. And the start and end of every action should be logged too. So file copy initiated at X time on this date. File copy completed at Y time on this date. If you ever, 
ever walk away from your computer, say to take a piss or go to the bathroom or grab a sandwich or a snack, while you have custody of anything in this manner, you have compromised custody and is not court admissible. So you should never, ever walk away from anything that you have been given custody for in a sock in terms of uh, evidence acquisition. Finally, there should be two or more copies of all the forms and lists uh, created and a copy should be locked in a fireproof safe forever. Uh, and then the master copy should be given to law enforcement when it is appropriate. I advise letting your organization lawyers deal with that. Um, most, uh, most computer people are not really that savvy at uh, dealing with law enforcement and you don't want them misspeaking or saying something dumb that uh, gets the case started on the wrong footstep um, or uh, misrepresent something about the way you've done this, the investigation as well as the way you uh, set up your network or etc. <clears throat> Next, you should have serious physical security for your SOC. It should have, if you're a large organization, you can afford it biometrics, an armed security guard, and badge access. If you have, if you're a small org, you should have at least badge access and CCTV cameras monitoring everything 24 seven with backed up feeds. Uh, everyone in the SOC, this comes for every, every single person uh, of every role should monitor on a daily basis full disclosure exploit db and all the other zero day and poc lists and security advisory lists especially security advisory lists for your vendors especially your operating systems your team that runs your SOC should have at least one software developer is capable of parsing large amounts of data in arbitrary format so you're going after someone you're going after someone who can uh, ninja script together some regex real quick uh, next you should have at least one sysadmin type and that is so when you're looking at tax in the PCAP so you can reckon he can he or she can recognize right away what types of attacks are concerning for the targets on your network and what won't work against the other uh, devices on your network for instance if it's exploiting a Windows service the sysadmin will recognize by the port hey that's a uh, this uh, Microsoft RPC service, it's not going to affect our Linux system, so we need to focus our efforts here. That can save you lots of time in the response. And the next reason you should have a sysadmin type is so they can update configurations uh, when there are security advisories, and uh, they can also go about doing this to reduce false positives and reduce your attack surface. Um, Anytime your digital forensics and incident response process reveals that uh, payment card information, PCI, HIPAA information, in other words, medical information, or other personal or, or other customer personally identifiable information, PII, is exposed, you should immediately notify law enforcement that instant, uh, and you should get your company lawyers involved. In fact, if you have company lawyers on call, you should call them first. And you should have them by the end of the phone call be ready to call law enforcement with all the details. There should be no delay um, in that process. Um, they shouldn't, you know, hang up the phone and then go take a nap and do it tomorrow. They need to hang up, they need to call them immediately after they're done talking to you. Uh, next, the last set of policies uh, are all considering um, uh, physical security and calm security um, and so I strongly recommend especially for large or large organizations that you have a monthly audit that you routinely inspect all of your physical network cables throughout your org to make sure there's no implants or vampire clamps present this is perhaps most important for say fortune 500 companies um, next, you should routinely inspect uh, all of your systems, perhaps on a rolling department-by-department department basis. 
uh, for any rogue USB sticks. And any USB sticks you find that no one can account for should be viewed as suspect. <clears throat> and you should commence basically a witch hunt to find the owner uh, and then also begin a f forensic analysis of what may be on the device. Uh, a policy I highly recommend is you should have no BYOD allowed in the SAW. You shouldn't be bringing your tablet, your laptop, or your personal cell phone into the SAW. You should check that all in at a locker outside of the SAW. Next, many people don't do this, but I highly recommend that you have no wireless communications in your SAW. And that is simply because if I were pen testing an organization and they had a SAW on the site, I would just wait outside and keep attacking that wireless comms, trying to break the crypto. And once I get in, I'm listening in on the most sensitive security discussions of your entire organization that can possibly give me access to systems and be worth a treasure trove. You should consider having a CCTV system inside your SOC and outside recording the door access, but inside your SOC pointed at your workstations just for legal evidence. This is very useful for proving chain of custody, for proving no one walked away, no one outside of the list of uh, access touched the, cust uh, the evidence and uh, it would be court admissible. Um, next, you should consider case locks and anti-tamper systems for your SOC systems as well as your server rooms. And uh, you should have a disaster recovery budget. Uh, that goes for small organizations too. Uh, you should have a rainy day budget for dealing with uh, potential intrusions and responding to them. And uh, lastly, you may want to consider having your entire SOC network uh, on a mobile IP block. This is so that in case a disaster hits and you need to actually physically relocate, you can resume monitoring the moment you get set up without uh, you know, uh, re-networking your org network. So if you're at the stage where you don't have a SOC and you're planning to build one, here are six general rules to keep in mind. Rule number one, your ability to detect attacks is based on what you log, capture, and record. Two, your ability to maintain your organization's security is no better than the security of your SOC. As I said, if the SOC gets compromised, it's game over. Your ability, number three, to analyze attacks and detect attacks is based on your personnel, not your tools. And that's because a fool with a tool is still a fool. Four, if you have to call in a third party for help and the digital forensics or incident response. The costs of this will rise extremely if you lack the following. A, a maintained digital forensics and incident response plan. B, a maintained network map. And C, if you don't have adequate logging. On that note, for uh, third parties that offer DFIR services, they really make bank when you lack any of these. This is their payday. Um, rule number five, you should have routine multi-spectrum penetration tests. And that is the only way to train your SOC and DFIR team to recognize the difference between malicious insiders versus outsider attacks. Number six, your staff needs to be able to investigate multiple theories at the same time. And that goes back to having people that don't panic and also having people that don't, do not jump to conclusions. <clears throat> so we covered this toolkit on the last lecture. I just have it here for these slides as a resource. It is not a complete toolkit, but it covers a lot of uh, professional tools, both in the free open source realm as well as the commercial realm. I've broken it down on category and then the bullets list the tools. The one thing we have not discussed is SIEM tools and SIEM stands for Security Information and Event Management. It is basically management software uh, 
infrastructure that takes in a lot of important inputs and helps you act on events. Um, in the realm of cybersecurity, you're not going to feel the whole building shake like you got hit by a missile, and uh, that's not going to cause you know red lights and alarms to go off. Instead, you rely on inputs like IDS alerts, logging aggregation, and some must-haves for logging aggregation solutions involve uh, real-time collection and strong end-to-end -end uh, encryption. A lot of sensitive things are disclosed in logs for certain, for certain systems, so you should have strong encryption there. You shouldn't be relying on old versions of SSL that have been owned. You should be able to aggregate unlimited feeds uh, or enough if you're selecting a solution for your org to scale to in the long term. You should be able to, for all your different feeds of logs, you should be able to group them by source and categorize them and build custom labels and everything and rules. You should have the ability to process raw text feeds from any source. You should have the ability to automate filters and event parsing. And finally, you should have the ability in your solution to normalize uh, and make adjustments to any of the, the, the logs that are being aggregated. The next category of solutions is log analysis and browsing. And for these solutions, you should be able to have unlimited dashboards and custom views and reports. It's really nice to have uh, a large number of default dashboards that are well constructed but sometimes it's hard for the user to determine how well constructed they are and sometimes they fall into the pit of just relying on the defaults which may not necessarily be the best situational awareness report and dashboard for their organization and the attack surface. Next you should be able to have unlimited search, saving, and graphing of all of the data uh, in your logs with your analysis and browsing tools. In the next category, event detection and analysis, and the main must-have is that there should be customizable event filtering and customizable alerts. Finally, you need to be able to trigger actions automatically through your SIEM and that basically comes down to it needs to be able to do anything that you can already script and do remotely. And also, a good must-have is IDS Signature Addition and Suppression. This way, it can suppress IDS alerts in order to investigate other theories, or in order to, uh, primarily, that means trimming false positives. There are a lot of different solutions that exist for just logging aggregation. For Linux systems, the default logging client is typically syslog. It's free, open source, it's a daemon that allows processes to send it log messages and syslog will route and store those messages accordingly. Some alternatives to it are rsyslog or syslog-ng. Metalog is also highly recommended. Uh, it's a free open source alternative to syslog. It's also a SIEM and can trigger script events on certain patterns and events. Also worth mentioning here are Logstash, Scribe, Flume, Graylog2, and Splunk. For aggregation of logs, uh, there are rsyslog, syslogng, Logstash, CollectD, which is daemon, uh, that has to be configured by its network plugins, Splunk, OSSEC, OSSIM, and NXLog. There are many others that are not on these lists. For Windows, the default logging client is going to be the Windows Event Log, or the Windows Event Forwarding Service, and the Windows Remote Management Service. And these can be configured to forward the events and logs off to a remote managing service. <coughs> Splunk is also worth mentioning here in this category uh, for enhancing logs. Aggregation services for Windows include the default Windows Event Collector service, as well as OSSEC, OSM, and commercial services like Logly and Splunk. 
and there are many others. Many of the commercial services that should be noted have a free version that handles a limited number of reports or feed sources, which may work for smaller organizations. For log browsing and analysis, the Linux tool systems are commonly just bash tools for reading files, cat less, more, uh, grep, watch. There's also multi-tail. For analysis, there are many options. I've only listed a few, but uh, in my experience, Graphite is pretty useful. Sysdig is good. There's OSSEC, OSM also in this category, and Splunk. For Windows, the Windows Event, Terror, uh, Event Viewer is the default browser for events. Um, I find it to be terrible because it's not easy to just grep through everything. And you have to click on things and scroll through entire lists of all the events that happened in a time period and then right click on individual ones to view the properties. It's, it's just not streamlined in my experience. For analysis, there's OSSEC, OSM, Splunk. Finally, the universal all-in-one SIEM tools that I can recommend uh, are for free open source are Prelude, OSM, OSSEC, LogWatch, GrayLog2, and commercial ones I've used are Splunk, SolarWinds, Log, and Event Manager, and I'm sure there are other good ones. I just can't personally recommend others in this category. Now finally, resources that organizations should have prepared before doing incident response are listed on this slide. On the left column I have resources that small organizations must have and some advice at the bottom. And for large orgs I have the relevant resources on the right. For small orgs you absolutely need packet captures. You need OS events and file system logging. And you need log aggregation for the PCAPs and the OS logs. You should try getting some free open source SIEM tool to manage this for you. And you should try getting a toolkit of the free open source list for the DFIR toolkit. In the meantime, for small organizations that can't staff and fund a large SOC and DFIR team, there are many things you can do to increase your chances of surviving an attack. Um, a, you want to minimize all of your liability. You want to have third parties run your online storefront, checkout, and PCI process. You want to have third parties run your payroll and etc. They, by offering these service ha services, have to maintain the highest levels of PCI compliance. And if they lose that, their entire company goes under because that is their entire service. So they take it very seriously. Um, two, you want to minimize your attack service wherever possible. Uh, you also want to try having two-factor authentication on everything in the org that you can. And you want to... Uh, have a policy of requiring strong passwords and, tr and for, for orgs it's really worthwhile requiring using a password manager um, and that at least some password manager service that is well reviewed uh, so that you don't get hacked like other organizations that use weak passwords and share them all by emailing them to each other very bad practice um, for large orgs, you want to have a team that can do 24-7 monitoring. You want flow capture and PCAP capture. You want OS events and file systems, and those, these are all going to be aggregated to your SOC. And you want FOSS and uh, a mix of FOSS and commercial DFIR tools, but you should buy based on quality, not price, um, and use case and need. You may have service license agreements and DFIR contracting and consultant agreements uh, worked out so that you can access these uh, services on demand and you're going to want biometric security and security guards and you should be monitoring utilities at all your CDN POPs. Now for the final exam review. 
is going to be a take home final. It is open notes, open book. It is worth 100 points. It is only five questions. They are long answer questions. You only have to answer four to get 100. If you answer the fifth question, it will be counted as extra credit. Each question is only worth 25 points. You have one week to complete it. it do not procrastinate it, as many of the questions require serious thought and may require you to do some research. Here are things that you should know for the final exam. At this point in the course, you should be able to thoroughly distinguish between bugs, exploits, and exploit techniques. You should be able to distinguish between various impacts of vulnerabilities, such as remote code execution versus denial of service. You should be able to distinguish between privilege escalation and simple privilege abuse. You should be able to distinguish between scanning versus actual attacks versus post-exploitation attacks. You should be able to distinguish between web application exploitation, modern binary exploitation, and network attacks. You should know what beats each exploit mitigation we've covered so far. You should know why signature-based antivirus fails. You should know how to chain together exploits for vulnerabilities and weaknesses, such as using an info leak and a memory corruption vuln to gain access, or to land your exploit. You should understand how attacks work through firewalls, and that's simply by attacking the network over the allowed ports and services. This may rely on getting the victims to come to you in, uh, in say, a watering hole attack. Next, you should know how attacks work through web application firewalls. You should understand the big picture. Um, here's some examples just uh, on modern binary exploitation. You should understand how to exploit a stack buffer overflow with stack cookies, uh, understanding the conditions that uh, you can exploit those in. Uh, and then also with DEP and then with ASLR. We discussed this in uh, previous lectures and it only works in specific cases, but those are often the most valuable uh, cases to target. <clears throat> you should understand when you need to know uh, to use another bug or weakness and you should understand this process for heat buffer overflow Obviously, stack cookies should not really affect your heat buffer overflow. You should understand how to exploit uh, integer bugs that lead to an arbitrary write under various mitigations. You should understand how to exploit a overflow that only allows you to corrupt one byte of a, say, return address on the stack, um, or of a uh, function pointer or some other form of control flow data. You should understand how to exploit a use after free. You should understand how to exploit uh, the use of uninitialized variables when when that's applicable it's not always exploitable it often depends on the logic of the application you should definitely understand how to exploit format string bugs especially if you only control say the upper half of an address and you can only partially overwrite it some concluding remarks for the entire class Proactive security is the only way to stay ahead or to keep pace with attackers in the field of cybersecurity. And that is only true as long as you act on the penetration test and goal assessment reports. If you're just getting your pen test to check a box, you will never actually be secure from the pen test. You will never keep pace with attackers, and you may not even be detecting the attacks succeeding against your organization. Two. Studying offensive skills and developments is really the only way to keep up with the security field. 3. Fools with tools will always still be fools. That's why I stuck to teaching the 
raw fundamentals throughout this entire class. It does not help anyone to test them on how well they can use today to, or yesterday's tools. Uh, certifications that just rely on this grow very stale and useless uh, over time. It doesn't take that much time. It's a very fast moving field. These fundamentals that I've taught you pretty much have applied for 20, 30 years. Um, and so when you are doing vulnerability assessments and pen tests, you should always strive to go beyond just what the tools you're using tell you. You should, you should develop your own attacks for the uh, services that you can detect and try to get POCs for any services up and running. Uh, if you can find they're running a vulnerable version and you find POCs working, you should be able to take them, manipulate them, and get them working in the pen test. If you have any feedback on the course, I'd be very happy to hear it. And you can email me at owen at hackallthethings.com.